we got our first one already. Awesome. Hold on one second here. We got Wesley coming in to join and share a scary story. How you doing tonight? Hey, how are you, man? Good. How you doing, Wesley? Oh, I'm doing awesome. real well. Um, I first got to kind of set this up. Um, my great grandfather was Woodrow Wilson, the president. And my dad and I were traveling from Los Angeles, California to Texas. And um, we got out on the desert and I'm not for sure exactly. We went past a town called Yuma, Arizona, um, and then went on out of ways. And I looked out in the middle of the desert and I seen something, I don't know what it was. Um, lights were all the way around the thing. It did kind of look like a disc, but I couldn't tell you it was kind of far off. And that thing came up and hovered for just a minute and took off. Well, and I mean, it was fast. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what is that? He said, oh, that's just, that's just light shining over the hill over there. There's nothing there, you know, don't worry about it. But he was in the government too. And he died about three years ago. He has never, ever told me what he saw out there. He would never acknowledge it. But I was a little kid. I remember just like I was yesterday. You know, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. This thing went up, and it looked like it hovered about 100 feet in the air. And, buddy, that thing took like a bolt of freaking lightning. This is the first time I've talked about it in about 35 years. But it was weird. It was weird to say the least. I don't, I don't know if it's a UFO or I don't know what it was. Yeah. But if anyway. It's off fast, if it's taken off fast like that, I'm sure it's some kind of UFO. Well, I was, you know, that's what I wanted to think. And, of course, my dad was in the government, and I'm not going to say what he was, but um, he was in the government. And when when I confronted him about it, we we went. I, I asked oh, him immediately when I seen it. And then he didn't say anything. He kind of passed it off in the next town. I confronted him and asked. Right, you, you keep cutting out on it. The problem was there wasn't no hills there. It was all flat desert. Yeah, it was all flat desert where he was at. He blamed it on the flat hills you know, or the hills out there. There's just lights in the hills. There wasn't no hills, man. <laughs> no, you, you I don't know, can't. man. It was kind of weird. That's the only time I've ever seen anything like that. Have you looked around on TikTok, YouTube, but, uh, to other anyway, videos to go see down. if anything looks like that? I have never seen anything else like that ever. Oh, wow. Um, the, that's the first time and the last time. Um, I did think, I, I live down by the Gulf Coast in Texas now, and here a while back, I thought I seen something up in the air. I wasn't making a whole lot of noise, but I wasn't for sure, you know, so I don't, I, you know, I don't want to say I saw anything because um, I do wear glass and it could have been something, you know, I don't know. But that's the first time. And this thing, the light, the coloring of the light, yeah. it's hard to explain the coloring of the light. The light was a kind of a turquoise blue, turquoise blue green color, and it would fade into a light, I don't know, like a pink color. And it was going around the outside. And then all of a sudden there was a like a white big light that came out of the bottom of it and went up and hovered and man, it took off. And I was like, what the crap? But my dad would never acknowledge to me that he even seen anything, but I did. I guarantee you I did. So you, you know how big it was? Like, could you make an estimate of how big it was? Do you think? Well, I was kind of far away from it. Um, to me, it from, I mean, I was a kid but thinking back now, I would say somewhere, it looked like it may have been uh, maybe 50 to 100 feet wide, uh, maybe by, oh, I guess 35, 25 to 35 feet tall. And it, it didn't, what I seen, it did not have any legs on it. There was nothing that it was sitting on. It looked to me like it was hovering above the ground. And when we came out across the desert, uh, with those lights, we was going, you know, on the highway. It was, I guess it was probably, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile from the highway. 
but it was still very obvious as to what it was and um, that, that there was something. But like I said, I tried for years. My dad died at 85 and I would ask him and ask him and ask him about it. He would never, ever acknowledge what he's seen. I know he's seen it. I know he did, but he wouldn't acknowledge it. Right. So it's kind, of, it's kind of weird, you know. Um, he had, he had, he was a Mason. He had friends up in the Masonry and, you know, and there was other people that were involved and he was in the government and stuff. So I don't know if he just, just kept his mouth shut because he needed to or, you know, I don't know. Um, but I just, this is the first time in 35 years I've even said anything about it. But I remember seeing that thing just like it was yesterday. So I, I wanted to tell you about it. But. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming out and us uh, sharing it here for the first time in 35 years. It's amazing. So. Well, you know, I mean, when your dad doesn't talk about it, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of scared me to say anything uh, because my dad was mil or not. I'm gonna leave that alone. But my dad was in the government, and yeah. and he worked for the government, and uh, <laughs> I just don't. I didn't say anything because that, you know, I didn't want, I didn't know if there, because he wouldn't say anything. I didn't know if there's get in trouble or, you know, somebody say something about it, but I figure now it's been long enough. There's a lot of them talking about it now. So I guess I can talk. I don't know, but it was, it was weird to say the least. It is. Yeah. When you see something like that, you don't know what to make. Of it, that's for sure. Well, you don't, you, to me, after I got up older, you know, you don't want to say anything to people because you don't want people thinking you're a nutcase or something wrong with you, you know, right. because a lot of people just will not accept that there may be something out there. And um, with the stuff that I've been seeing on television, I, you know, of course, I watch a lot of shows, too, and I know there's a lot of make-believe, but I feel like there's some truth to some of that stuff, you know. But... Uh, oh. Anyway, well, man, I'll let you go. I got to get in here and go to bed. I got to go do my job here in a little bit. So All I right. appreciate you having me on, though. Yeah, absolutely. The first one of the night, and you're welcome back anytime. If you see anything else, let us know. Yes, sir. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Bye bye. Bye bye. Should be joining any second. Hold up, wait a minute. Let me put some bass in it. Hey, how's it going, buddy? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> All right. I was I was uh on here last time with the green glowing goblin chick or whatever it was. Uh but yeah, yeah, um I got kind of a personal one to share. I I, I was thinking about sharing it last time, but I didn't know for sure, you know, if I should share it or not. Um, uh, I think it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be like a legal matter or nothing now. Um, hello, it's kind of, are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is my phone is kind of low. I just, okay. So, um, I, I, uh, was crossing the street, uh, uh, uh just, uh, about, six months ago um and um i was hit by uh by a car and uh i didn't see nothing there was nothing coming in both directions there was a little bit of of uh you know melee going on you know people were trying to you know get where they're going going left or straight or to the right you know and um it was late at night Late at night, so it's kind of you know a little blurry for my uh, per perception of things from what I can remember. Um, as I crossed, um, I just heard a whoosh, you know, and I blacked out. And when I came to, there was people screaming because uh, my 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 skull or, or the scalp at least had split and I was bleeding profusely. I had been throwing, it hit the, his windshield and I was throwing through the air. Um, and I got multiple, uh, broken bones, back, neck, spine, shoulder. 
Um, it was all on the right though. It didn't. It didn't hit my left. Um, and the guy was the guy that was there. They hit me. Um, the people, you know, he, I, I heard him go, oh, you know, something, something in Spanish, I think he was saying. And they're like, you're not going nowhere, you know. And they're like, you stay right there. You stay right there. He's all, he's all, he's all, oh, man. He's like, he's like, uh, I, I hit the guy, you know, I hit him real hard, you know. And uh, he said, I hit him at 45. And, and they're like, 45, are you crazy? You see this guy? He could die. He, he's, he can, you know, he, he's probably, you know, I'm just like, I'm trying to like, you know, stay conscious. And I'm trying to like, you know, just, just keep my, my kind of composure a little bit, you know? And they're just like, just flipping out, you know? And, um, <clears throat> So I started to kind of black out and uh, the paramedics had come and I was in the ER or the, or no, the ICU. And um, they're like, we're going to have to do surgery. You know, he has a brain bleed. And then they checked again and there was no brain bleed. And then they're like, you know, we have to do surgery on his leg and we you know, hurry up, we can prep him this and that. And so they're bringing me there and they're like, Wait, he's like, uh, no, we don't have to do, we don't have to do the surgery on his leg. And it was like, I was, I was like, what, what's going on? Why, why, uh, why are they, you know, saying no surgery? You know, surgery then no surgery, surgery then no surgery. You know, um, yeah. and the only thing I could think of is, I was slowly healing. You know, even there. Um, and uh, like they said, brain bleeds, they, they don't disappear. You know, but you got a brain bleed, you got a brain bleed. Right. Um, and so I, I started like trip because, you know, I, I was, I thought I was dying and I was, I was hallucinating. I guess I was hallucinating. And it was my mom. Um, it was real bright, but I could see her, her face and she was holding me. And singing, you know, songs she would sing, you know, You Are My Sunshine and uh, other other songs. And I'm like, Mom, am I dead? And they, I could hear also in the background echoing, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Stay with me. Stay with me, Jesse. Stay with me. But I was looking at her, you know, and she was just quiet and smiling you know, and, and then I'm looking around and I could see five crowned beings, um, bright, bright, like golden white light around with huge wings spanning all the way around. They all circled and, and connected all the way around and they were starting to sing. And I'm just like, this is it, you know, this is it. And, and th then I kept on hearing this lady and she's, you know, just pounding on me. I guess she's pounding on my chest and all that, you know, stay with me, stay with me, you know, Jesse, you know, you're not going to die. And then I, I started to come to a little bit and um, I realized where I was and I saw her, you know, um, and, uh, you know, everything short story. Uh, because that was pretty long. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, oh, it's all right. Uh, I survived it. Awesome. Um, they yeah. said getting hit at 20 miles an hour, the car's about three tons or more. And getting hit at 20 miles an hour, you're dead. It's fatal. And if I was hit at 45, um, it's even worse, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes you think, how the hell did I survive that? You know, and not only um, that, not only that, but you were also healing while you're sitting there in the hospital waiting to. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Because I mean, my my, my right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was. No, I'm done. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I 
I didn't hear you though. I'm sorry. My phone kind of broke up. But yeah, um, yeah, I just, I thought about saying it and telling you, but I was like, well, let me make sure, you know, I talked to you know, my sister and talked to everybody. And they're like, no, no, the guy didn't even have insurance. You know, of course not. You know, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> thank God I got Medi Cal, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that was just. I just, I just uh, think you know, some something, something like, like took most of that hit, you know, right? Or at least cushion, cushion my fall or something, you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, it just it makes you think, you know. Um, I, I, I kind of believe in. And spirits and, and, and entities and angels and I I've seen them, you know, and I've heard them and, and things like that, you know, um, but you know the whole thing about God or, or different things like that or people say you know oh that was a miracle or oh that that that's just you know some sort of great powerful phenomenon you know created by by God and different things it's like I didn't really believe in that that much you know because I thought. Okay, if that's the case, then all you guys that know how to heal, go clear out the hospitals. You know, right. yeah, make yeah. every everybody well right now. Just go and clear them out. You know, as as it just made me think, but it kind of makes me think. You know, it was a miracle. It was miraculous that I survived that. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm still recovering. You know, and it's hard to to get around and, you know, stuff and, you know, still in immense pain, but, um, you know, I'm here, you know, and, right. uh, it's just, you know, it makes me think like, why, you know, out of everybody, why me, you know, uh, it's just, you know, this just makes you think, you know, <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope yeah. We wish you a quick recovery there. I'm glad you're all right now. And uh, thank if you. Think of any uh, anything pops up in your head that's been strange, or you've seen something, you know, UFO, yeah. whatever. Definitely I know call that. Back in. We'll be doing this once a week, so. Oh yeah, I know that didn't really go. Along. Did that did that kind of go along the lines a little bit, or? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, okay. You were hit by okay. a, a, are that fast and something (laughs) oh i know i know what the weird part was they estimated the hit and it was 20 miles an hour but the guy was flipping and saying i hit him at 45 that is strange yeah so that's what that's what made me think like and I was upset like wait what are you are you trying to like get this guy off or what's going on you know and yeah. uh they estimated it now the hit to the car itself was you know a, a large impact but for some reason it came back 20 25 miles an hour so that was really strange there was no brakes included in it yeah uh, you huh. know, there's no skid marks, so I don't know. Really strange. Another one for the books. <laughs> I think so. I think so. All right. Thank All right. Thanks, so buddy. Much. I appreciate okay. it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You have a good night now. You too, buddy. Bye. All right. Uh oh, we have somebody coming on the line. Let's hit a few buttons, and we have Yuri back. All right, Yuri. Hold on one second. Hey. Hi. How are you? Welcome back. How you doing? Thank you. I'm well. I'm well. Um I'm good. I have another story for y'all tonight. Um Oh boy. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, like I said, I have a lot. Um but this one goes back to when I was a little girl. Um, okay. Uh as a child, 
period point blank, I've always been able to see things, uh, even as a little girl, like toddler age, up until my adulthood, even now. Uh, and I've been able to hear stuff as well, like spirits, all kind of stuff. But anyways, uh, this particular story, um, I was like, mm, I say maybe five years old. And um, at the time, my brother, he's like a year and a half up under me. So he had to be like three, about to be four. And we lived in the, back then we lived in the projects, right? Yeah. And, um, and I remember as a little girl, I used to have all these weird experiences with this particular closet in our apartment. Uh, the closet was connected to the hallway, but it was also connected to my room. So my mom and dad at night, when they would go to sleep, beings, different beings would come out of my closet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... When I say different beings, I mean from like extraterrestrials to, I, I hate to sound superstitious or whatever. Some people may not believe me, but I don't give a fuck. I don't have nothing to hide. But I used to see extraterrestrials, um, what appeared to be vampires, uh, skinwalkers. Anyways, the closet, now that I'm older, I understand that where we lived, that particular area, there was a portal. I didn't know that back then, though. You know, being a little girl, I used to be, like, scared of shit. So this yeah. one particular night, though, because usually what they would do, they would come out my closet and then go out this, like, we had, like, a sliding open window door that was by my room so they would go out the door and I just used to hide up under my covers every time they would come out because I was scared of them but this particular night was different and these were other beings that visited me this particular night and I remember it was like five of them that came out and they came around my bed. I had a big, uh, what do you call those beds? The one with the little thing hang hanging over it like a little princess. Anyways, I had one of those beds and uh, all five of them circled around my bed it was like two on one side two on the other one and then this one really really tall beam in the middle at the end by my foot now when they came out you couldn't see their features because they had on like these coverings or whatever yeah but when they took off the coverings they lit up like light. And they were, you know, they all lit up and they put one hand like down on top of my legs to hold me down. But I was screaming. I was screaming, but it was almost like my mom and dad couldn't hear me. Nobody could hear me. But right. I was screaming. <laughs> I was screaming for my life because I was so scared. Right. Although when they touched me, I couldn't, like, I didn't feel no harm. Like, they didn't harm me. But I was just so scared by their presence. And then the very, very tall one in the middle, it communicated with me. You know, not through speaking, but, you know, mentally, like telepathically. What did it say? It told me to, that it's like, they told me that 
it's okay. They were not here to hurt me. But as a five year old, I couldn't under, you know, I couldn't interpret, I couldn't understand that because right. I was looking at how they looked. And I couldn't understand why they lit up the way that they did. And they looked totally different than a human being. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, and their bodies were like, um, I'm trying to describe their bodies. Um... You know how most alien drawings, it didn't look like that. They had bodies like maybe an insect. I'm trying to think about the best insect. Almost like a prey mantis. I'll say that. Like that tall stature type of body. All right, I get you. But yeah, and their their heads, their heads mm, were kind of like a blonde shaped or whatever. They look like giant insects, honestly, to me. Oh boy! <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they look like giant insects, and um, but they were not, they weren't bad. If I could say that they were not bad, but the tall one communicated to me that they were not here to hurt me, and uh, he told me that I was special, and he said that that's why they were there. And I just remember looking at them, and I kept saying, "Please leave," you know, like "Please go away," and I kept yelling, "Mommy, Daddy!" But no, I know they couldn't hear me because I guess they blocked off the sound or whatever with their little special powers and then they they after they did something because my blanket lit up after they touched me and then once my blanket lit up and I saw it I was like you know I didn't feel nothing but I saw what went off into my blanket it was like an energy and uh, and then after that, they put their cloths on, and the tall one that was communicating with me telepathically told me goodbye, and they went back into the closet. They didn't go outside like the other beings did. They went back into the closet. And uh, I remember after that, I was yelling some more, and my mom and dad came in, and I was like, the monsters came out the closet. The monsters came out the closet and my dad went in there and he didn't see nothing. And he was like, I'm getting tired of this. <laughs> you know, he was like, I'm getting tired of this. Every night you do it the same thing. And I was just sitting there crying because I'm like, I'm for real. I'm serious. The monsters came out the closet. But now that I'm older, I explained to my parents what happened. And yeah, they apologized to me. Because my dad told me he always believed in extraterrestrials, but when I was little and going through that stuff, he didn't understand what was going on. Because to him, I called them monsters back then, but really they were extraterrestrials. Yeah. So that <laughs> happened in my, yeah, that happened when I was a really young girl. I have, like I said, I have so many stories. And I've had a lot of encounters with a lot of different experiences. Paranormal, supernatural, yeah, all kind of stuff. But well, you're um, welcome, as always, to come back and share another one with us. I love them. <laughs> they are yeah. creepy. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> that one last night was wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was wild. That was like, now that one happened in my adult life and that really creeped me out as an adult. And I don't really get creeped out that much, you know, now as I used to, even, even now, because I'm in my late 30s. So 
I don't get that creeped out like I used to because now I understand more. But I also realize that the older I get, the more intense things get so far as in the more intense my experiences are. Because I get contact from a lot of different things and beings, spirits, and all of them aren't nice. <laughs> all of them are not nice and they don't look nice either. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah well, but definitely come back and tell us some more. Definitely. I mean, these are great. That's someone else. Now. Hold on here. Excuse me. We got Jose coming in hot. <laughs> Let's see. There he is. How are you? Hey, how you doing, guys? Going on? Uh, nothing. I'm just listening to Yuri. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah, that was a great, another great one. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, uh, I was actually talking to my girlfriend today, and uh, I told her about the story that she said about the girl in the restaurant. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, when especially when she said that, uh, that she went towards the, the doors of the convenience store, and then the doors got open, and... She disappeared in the middle of the air, and then she went inside, and then you start seeing all this crap flying around the store. You yeah. know, I was, I was, <laughs> man, around. that yeah. that freaked the heck out of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So, uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, you're uh, you're not alone because I'm pretty much I can tell that uh, that we kind of have the same kind of the same experiences, you know, and, and as you said on, on your, on your story, uh, before you t told your story, uh, I feel the same way as you did, you know, when, when I was so growing up, I had all these experiences and stuff. And like I said last night about my family that I was always reaching out for my mom and they thought it was, I was just making shit up. And, yeah. uh, I know how it feels, you know, I know, I really know how it feels because <clears throat> even now, you know, like I said yesterday, I'm 50 years old. I really, I don't see the, the point, you know, or sense to, to lie about some of the experiences that I have, you know, like, like you said, I don't give a shit what they think, you know, I know what some of the stuff has happened. Right. And, um, so I'm here to tell you another story. Um, this happened to me, I would say, uh, four years ago. Uh, I got out of uh, this relationship with uh, that I had with a girlfriend. And uh, she went through my phone and she saw some comments of uh, that uh, another female friend of mine said. And she went to my phone and she took it. Like it was real, even though you know it was just a joke, and uh, so she got her, she got really pissed off and kicked me out of the house. So I end up moving with another friend, another friend to a trailer park. So the guy, basically, he went, he went to Mexico, and I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and he called me. I called him. I said, hey, man, are you in town? And he was, he was like, no, uh, I'm in Mexico right now. I said, well, shit. I said, I don't have a place to stay tonight. Uh, I just got kicked out, you know. And he was like, well, I just bought a trailer. If you want to go over there, I mean, there's no utilities. There's no power. Uh, I mean, you're just going to be on the dark. And I said, well, you know what? That's better than sleeping on my truck. So uh, how do I get in? He's like, well, Go on the front of the porch, and uh, you're going to see a mat, and there's a key underneath the mat. Just make yourself at home. There's no furniture. There's nothing. You know, I haven't even moved in into it, but I bought it. And I was like, okay. So he gave me the code to this trailer park. I got to the trailer park, punched the code, got in. 
I'm looking for the house and uh, finally I found it, you know. So <clears throat> I went inside. It was dark. It was about close to 11.30 at night. Everything is dark. And uh, as I'm walking in, you know, he's got this. It was like a deck, but it wasn't that big. It was like a, uh, it was almost like 10 feet wide by 12. And it was about like three feet up in the air. So I had to, you know, went to the staircase, walk on the porch. So I got in. Uh, I had a blanket and a pillow with me. So I went inside and uh, since everything was dark, I was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to sleep on the, on the, uh, on the limb room. You know, because uh, as soon as I walked in, I just, I mean, the atmosphere was so dense. You know, it, it, it almost made me feel like I wasn't alone on that place. And I wasn't even welcome on it, if that makes any sense to you guys. Yeah. So anyway, got inside and uh, I was like, well, you know, I mean, I felt like crap. You know, because I was, I just, I just ended like a two year relationship over a joke. So I was like, well, you know what? I said, all right, babe, maybe it's for the best. And uh, so I just got uh, laid on my blanket and put the pillow against the wall. And I'm standing right in front of the door, the front door. And uh, well, this door, uh, you could see like, you can see a crevice around the door. You know, it was like there was light coming in, even though the, the door was closed. It's almost like the the weather guards were gone. Oh, all right. So, so I'm leaning against the wall, and I noticed, because, uh, I mean, it wasn't like total dark, you know. I walked in, laid on, the, on my blanket, and I'm looking around, you know, because, I mean, I, I felt this presence inside you know i didn't i didn't know what it was at the time but i'm just like okay i said well you know what i'm just maybe it's just my imagination it's a new place whatever you know and uh i'm just gonna close my eyes and i'm gonna try to get some sleep and i had i had a i don't know if i could i can actually say it here but i was armed i had i had a an arm with me okay so I put it on below my pillow, I mean underneath my pillow, and I just I just went to sleep, you know. I looked uh the living room and the kitchen, it's almost like whoever that lived on that house before they did some remodel and they took that wall, the wall that separated the kitchen from the diner and the living room. So it was like this huge space. And I could, you could see all the way through the, to the kitchen, you know, so it was the cabinets and everything. So I'm laying there and I'm just trying to go to sleep, you know, and I'm just closing my eyes and I'm just trying to concentrate and going to sleep. That moment is almost like someone told me to look at the kitchen, you know, it, it, I mean, I can explain it, you know. But it was like I had this feeling that I had to turn around and look in the kitchen. As, I, as soon as I did, there's this girl standing right between, you know, the wall that separated the, the wall that was taken off. It, it was like it was standing right there between the kitchen and the living room. Oh, boy. But uh, I was I was looking at her. It was uh, she was. I would say she was no older than 14. You know, it was uh, it was it was a little girl. Okay. And I could see through her, you know, and I'm looking at her. I see. I mean. I couldn't make up it's her face, you know, it was just like this pale, whatever. And I'm just looking at her and she just looking at me. And. As soon as I closed my eyes and I shook my head, you know, because I was like, maybe I'm just dreaming and I just, 
I mean, I did it like in a blink of an eye. I turn around and she's gone. So I'm like, I'm like, what the? I'm like, no, I'm just, I mean, it's just my imagination, whatever, you know. So I lay back on bed. I mean, I, I just turned back around. And I said, you know what? I, I took my arm out, I cocked it up, put it on my lap. And I said, all right. I said, if this crap happens again, I'm just going to start just shooting, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so I just start concentrating to go back to sleep again. And suddenly I heard these steps on the deck, uh, which is right outside the front door. And I hear it, you know, I hear it like climbing the stairs, you know, but it didn't sound like, how can I, how can I describe it? It, it didn't sound like a person. It sounded more like he was uh, like a horse, you know. It almost sounds like it was a, a set of uh, hoops, if, if that makes any sense. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, I mean, remember, you know, I'm, a, I'm wide awake and I got my gun with me. And I'm like, what the hell is that, you know? And this trailer park is like in the middle of the woods, you know. So I'm like, maybe it's a deer, right? So I'm just sitting there and I'm looking at the front door. And like I said, you know, there's this crevice that I'm actually looking the side. I mean, the light coming, shining from the outside in. And it was a pretty good gap. It was like a almost like half inch gap. So this thing just keep on walking on the on the deck and I can hear it, you know, but it was just uh <laughs> It was like two steps at the time. I mean, I didn't hear like the normal, the four steps. Uh, when when a deer's walking, it's almost like two, you know? And I was like, what the hell is that, you know? I guess it's a dude walking around with boots and he's making all this noise. I mean, it just all these things, you know, start to come up to my... And I, I'm just trying to make sense of what the hell is going on. Yeah. So this thing, it stands right on the front door. And I'm watching, you know, because all I could see is just the, the kind of like the, the frame of it, you know, just just the edge of it, you know. And I'm seeing like I saw this leg, but it wasn't a human leg. It was more like a goat. And uh, and as I'm, I'm looking down and I see, you know, I, I mean, it, it looked like like a goat standing up, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at at the bottom and I'm just like start scanning all the way up and as I'm going up I see an arm you know and 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 I see almost half of his face so this thing had horns definitely had horns but his torso it was like a more like a like a human like a man you know and I'm like I'm like what the hell is that and that and that crap is trying to open the door you know, I can hear, I can see that the, the the doorknob starts to wiggle around, you know, and I'm just looking at it. And, you know, I mean, the first thing I just grabbed my gun and I just pointed it at, at the front door. You know, I'm like, what the shit is that? Anyway, you know, I'm just like shaking and, you know, I'm like, I didn't know what to do. And this thing, it just like, it just let go of the knob. He stepped back and he just walked off and he left. So I'm like, I said, shit, well, now I know that I'm not going to be able to sleep, you know? So I kept, I kept awake the whole night. So anyway, the next day, uh, you know, once a day I, I saw sunlight, I came outside, you know, and I'm just looking around to see if I can find any tracks or whatever. And I'm trying to make sense out of it. Well, I start, I start. Uh, unloading the stuff that I had on my truck and I start bringing it inside the trailer. And uh, just out of nowhere, you know, this guy walks out of the fucking bushes, you know, and I'm looking at it and I'm, I mean, that motherfucker made me jump. So I'm like, what the fuck? I said, dude, I said, what are you doing? The guy's like, oh man, I didn't mean to scare you. And he's like, hey, do you have a beer? 
And I'm like, oh, I said, uh, actually, I do, man. I said, I got, I got a cooler on, my, on the back of my truck, and I, uh, yeah, you can have one. The guy, so he, he just like, hey, do you need some help? I said, no, dude, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, uh, and um, so he's like, okay. So the guy just leaves, right? And I'm just like, okay, fine. So a week later, you know, once that I got situated on the house and I got familiar with it with uh, uh on the trailer i started walking around you know just kind of investigating i mean what because uh the person that lived there before he left a lot of um um it was almost like angel figures you know and but she had a shitload of them you know uh she had a lot of crosses and i mean it almost looked like the person that lived there before she was catholic and uh, I was like, okay, so I got great respect of any kind of religion, so whatever, you know. So I didn't want to just throw them, throw them uh, on the garbage, you know. So to me, right. they're, they're kind of sacred. So I just put them on a the bag and put them outside. So as I'm putting out the bag outside, this guy comes out of the fucking bushes again. You know, same guy. And I'm looking at him. I said, dude, I said, you need to stop doing that shit. The guy looked at me like, man, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to freak you out. So what do you think about the house? And I was like, uh, I said, man, I said, do you know the people that used to live here before? And the guy started describing the damn trailer on the inside. And he started telling me everything about it. I mean, and he's describing the, 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 the trailer to the teeth. You know, I mean, it, he just like giving me details about the whole thing. And I'm like, dude, have you been inside? It's like, no, my grandmother used to live there. And I'm like, OK, so I said, so I grew up on that trailer. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was kind of weird, you know, and and as a matter of fact, there's a little angel figures and all that stuff that um, that uh, then uh. That I collected, and I don't want to throw them to the garbage. And since you're the grandson, I said, why don't you just take him? The guy's like, no, it's okay. You can just get rid of them. And uh, and then he and then he told me because I told her, I said, look, I said I saw a little girl the other day, and he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't pay any mind to it. My mom, she was like really, uh, she was really, I think that she was kind of crazy. You know, because she kept, she kept on telling us that she saw a little girl inside. And that's that's exactly the same thing that you're describing. I said, what I, what I, I think, I think that my grandmother, she was kind of a little out there. She was crazy because she kept, she kept on telling me that there was this animal that was trying to get inside her house the whole time. So she got some holy water, water and put it all around the windows and the front door. Because that's how this thing wanted to get in, inside to the front door. I looked at him. I said, you motherfucker need to get the fuck away from here. I said, are you fucking serious? He's like, yeah, I'm not making this shit up. I never told the guy what I saw. But he was the same description that, you know, that, that I just told you guys. I was like, oh, man. So... That's pretty much it. That's that's the whole story, you know. I was just like, man, I said, I just, I just, I mean, he just right then, he, he, he pretty much told me without telling me anything that I wasn't crazy. And there was actually something trying to get inside the trailer. Uh, a few weeks later, my friend came back from, from Mexico and, uh, and pretty much he told me that, he told me that the first night that he spent on that trailer, that something grabbed him by the legs and pulled him off of the bed. Oh boy. And I didn't want to say anything. I mean, I didn't tell him anything about the, the thing that I had an encounter with or the little girl or whatever. But one thing that I did notice, and that's what I told you last time, that I keep having something following me around, knocking on my windows and my doors. And I guess for the next show, I'm just going to show you the the glass that, they, that it got broken like two weeks ago because something wow. was pounding on my glasses so hard that it actually shattered the glass. 
And once you see it where it is, because I'm going to I'm going to put my camera on and I'm going to show you exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it just spooky, man. It just uh, and, and there's more stories, you know, like I said before. And uh, but uh, I'll get you guys back. Uh, I'll get you next time with another one. Right, Thank you man. for listening to me. So Thank you. Uh, Thank you anytime, man. So she walks throwing roses and stories out there. Let's get her on. Hey, hey, Mr. Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. So what do you got for us tonight? Okay, so I thought I'd tell the story of how a lot of the stuff that has been happening to me in my life kind of coalesced and made sense. Um, so like everybody else, I for a very long time, I was confused about the things that I've been seeing and experiencing my entire life. And I thought maybe if I just ignored them, <laughs> they would go away. But... <laughs> They kind of didn't, and um, there was a good year or two worth. I was living on my own. It was just myself and my daughter, and um, we. I was experiencing a lot of activity in this new apartment that we had moved into, and <clears throat> it had all come to a head one summer. I sent my daughter to stay with her dad because that's how bad it was, Um and I was tired because I was scared to go to sleep. Um, I was disgruntled. Like, I was just at wit's end. And um, I had a horrible experience that kept me up one night. And I just was like, enough is enough. Like, I've done everything. I've burnt the sage. I've had people come in and cleanse the house. I've done everything I can. And it's still at a fever pitch. I'm done. Whatever happens next, like, we're fighting. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be fighting whatever is going on. And I went to sleep with that kind of energy, and I think that helped. Um, <clears throat> so I will just say, like, just before I went to sleep, I said out loud, like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to do whatever it is I need to do. Do, do I have to fight this thing? I'm going to sleep. Um, it was in the middle of the day. It was daytime out. And when I woke up, I was in a completely white room. I got the feeling like it was a box. It was a big white box. Um, and I wasn't alone. I got this amazing feeling like it wasn't that feeling like I'm, oh, I'm not, al I'm not alone. And there's something scary there. It was like, oh, I'm not alone and I'm supported. When I looked behind me because I was in a sitting position. But I had no chair. When I looked behind me, there was a woman standing behind me. She had a black bob. She was really tall and thin. And she just told me to calm down. And I was like, okay. And she was like, I, she was speaking, but she wasn't really speaking with her voice. I could hear her though. And she said, um, you know, I know what's been happening to you. And I'm, I'm about to show you how to deal with this. And I believed her, like, immediately when she said it. And <clears throat> the entity, I'm not going to go into description about what it is because I don't want to trigger anyone. Um, the entity that I'd been seeing around my apartment and um, that had been basically had me in this state of fear and was basically feeding off of it um, appeared like right in front of me in this white room with the woman standing behind me in her hand on my shoulder. And um, he immediately began like screaming at me in like a rage. And my first instinct was to try to wake up or just run or just start to fight. And again, she was just like, be calm and try to feel bad for it. Like, how did somebody who was alive at one point come to this, you know, come to this point in, in their existence? Try to feel bad about that. So I'm like, no, I want to run. And she's like, nope, just listen to me and, and do what I'm trying to tell you to do. 
So I did. I stared right at him. And I did, after a while, start feeling bad for him. Like, it, it took a while. This went on for quite a while. Um, and she was like, okay, now that you feel bad for him, try to think of what might have happened to him to bring him to this end. And I'm like, what? And as I'm doing that, I'm also getting information from her about the entity, which basically, I guess, he was a guy who died in his teens, um, didn't end up going anywhere. He didn't end up going to, like, heaven, hell, or anything. He decided to just stick around um, on this plane. And when he decided to do that, it lowered his vibration, his spiritual vibration. Um, and when his spiritual vibration was lowered, it basically turned him into a parasite. Um, he basically attaches himself to people who are also vibrating at a low frequency, um, people who are sad, who have depression, or who have just lost somebody like I did. And, you know, are going through it. Um, he uses that to upset the hell out of you and then basically siphons off that energy and goes to hang out on the astral plane and he uses that energy to, I don't know, appear powerful to other entities. That's literally all he does. That's his beginning, middle, and end. That's the end of the story. And knowing that made it so much easier to not be afraid. So I sat there for a good, God, it felt like it was hours. It really did. Um, getting this information and staring at this thing and watching it rage and go nuts like an animal in a cage, but it couldn't touch me. Um, so I finally just said it out loud. I was like, I feel sorry for you. And this thing, <laughs> when I said that, this thing started, it turned into a black, gooey, oily mass. Like, I don't even know how to explain it because I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in real life. Maybe like when they pull animals out of like oil slicks, that's what it turned into. And um, it started to shapeshift into basically everybody I've ever known in my life. Um, it turned into my mom and was screaming at me. It turned into my daughter, my sister, people I've worked with. Like just, it was just insane. It was just going completely nuts. And <clears throat> I guess it ran out of juice is basically the only way I can describe it. Like it just ran out of energy. It, it shouted itself into like oblivion and kind of returned to that disgusting oily black mass and when it did that for the last time the lady who was standing behind me said now watch this and a, a flight of stairs appeared and it ran down them like it tore ass down these stairs as if like I just hit it with something. Um, and after that, everything that was going on in my house, the uh, seeing people peeking at me from behind um, closed doors, things being pulled under the door while I'm in the room, like weird stuff like that, it all stopped. Like there was absolutely no more of like the physical presence of something in my house there was like this residual feeling that something was waiting outside, like in the backyard to get back into the house. I would get a lot of visions of that, of somebody standing out in the back of the house waiting to get in, but couldn't for whatever reason. And since that time, like I've moved, I moved um, almost a year to the day that that happened, I moved to New York from Massachusetts to New York. And <clears throat> while I've been here, I've still had a lot of 
paranormal kind of like um, encounters, but they've all been positive. No negative encounters at all. Um, no negative astral projecting or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I just thought I would tell that story because if anyone in here is dealing with negative spirits or negative entities or just negative uh, negative things all around, there is a way to circumvent all that. It does eventually end, but I think it starts with you like getting fed up before like somebody or something from the other side intercedes and is like, I think you're ready to like get rid of all the negative parts of this. So yeah, that's my story for tonight. <laughs> I mean, that's, that is scary. Especially the, what the scariest part I think for me was when you said you were sitting there without a chair. Yeah. That, I was the, like, <laughs> I was like picturing that. I'm like, Oh no, that just sets the tone right there. Yeah. <laughs> It was very comfortable, strangely enough. I was like, where's my chair? I remember thinking that, like, how am I sitting like this? <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on and sharing it. Um, Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Appreciate it. And if you have anything else that, that pops up in your head, definitely come back. We're going to be doing this at least once a week for now. And then, uh, we're just okay. testing it out during the week to see which one's the best. But every Sunday we should. Yeah. Every Sunday? Yeah, we're going to do every Sunday night uh, just to have a, you know, a set day. So. Sounds good. I'll be there. I'll be here. Awesome. <laughs> Can't wait to see you then. Jump back in the chat. I know you were going crazy in there. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's good people in. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. We have bring it on. Our next story by HBH Rescue is back. Let me get you on here. Sometimes Hi. it takes a second. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys tonight? Mm -hmm. And I love this. I love your show. I, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Well, so you. I have a question for you guys. Have any of you ever climbed in the rabbit hole about um, uh, skinwalkers? I've heard a little bit about it here and there, but not one of my main topics. I'm not sure if anyone so in the I, chat room. Um, I made a mistake one night of climbing in that rabbit hole. I run a rescue. I live with 70 animals at any given point and have for years. And I climbed in this rabbit hole one night reading up on skinwalkers, um, artificial intelligence or, or um, bio suits, uh, kind of like avatars, right? Okay. Well, I got, I got to really paying attention to the dogs in my house. At that time, there was 27 in the room, all laying down, all sleeping. But I had three dogs here that really don't act like dogs. They don't know how to dog. They don't, they don't act like normal dogs. So I asked. I said, okay, okay. I'm in a rabbit hole here, guys. And I'm talking out loud to these dogs. And I'm in the room with them. And I said, okay. I got to know. I think three of you guys in this room are skinwalkers. I believe you to be AIs. And if you are, I would like for you to acknowledge. Here's the thing. I don't mind living with you. I would just like to know. Right. The three dogs that I thought were got up and came and sat next to me. What? <laughs> yep. They sure did. 27 of them sleeping. Those three dogs got up, walked across the room and sat down next to me. Now, one of them is a collector. She collects stuff. She doesn't tear things up. She doesn't chew things up. She sees it. She just, she studies it. She'll turn it over. She sniffs it. She licks it. She looks at it. And once she's done, she never looks at that item again. Never. She doesn't bother it. She doesn't mess with it. She collects it and leaves it. Huh. Finally, I looked at her. I said, I know what you are. I know who you are. 
you are a scientist. And I said, and here's the thing. If there is anything in this house that you really don't understand and you want to know, bring it to me. I'll show it. I'll tell you what it is. That damn dog got up and went and got my hairbrush and brought it to me. Wow. I swear to God, brought me my hairbrush. So I showed her how to use it. She looked at it and I said, if you understand, put it away. She took it back and put it away. Oh, my God. Yeah, so my mom was sitting here when I did it. <laughs> but um, yeah, they'll acknowledge you if you acknowledge them. If you can acknowledge them, they'll acknowledge you. All three of them did. And it was the three that don't know how to. I say don't know how to dog. They don't do things like a normal dog at all. And I've had 1,500 dogs in my house in the last 10 years. I work oh, in a wow. shelter for 10 years. I deal with a lot of animals. I, I am an animal trainer. Now, we don't understand why we have an overpopulation of animals. We've had spayed and neuter programs around for 20 years. And we still can't get in front of the stray animal thing. How many stray animals around you pop up? out of nowhere where no one knows where they came from no one knows where they've been there's no history on these animals none no one's ever seen them before but all of a sudden they're just there right just food for thought yeah i mean that's you okay. know, maybe yeah. you should treat them a little differently have you had any other experiences with them since then or Always. I, I, it's, it's a constant thing, and I actually show other people now. Um, oh, no, you can I've, uh, I've like... brought several people. <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. It's, it's very interesting, but if you get to, if you're around a lot of animal behaviors, I have one here that glitches. And when I say glitches, one of the dogs that I have was identifying he will be walking and all of a sudden will just stop or will twitch or will do weird things like the program is glitching well one morning this dog was really acting very very strange and finally i just said programmer reset it it's not working correctly you need to reset this program that dog walked over laid in a kennel went to sleep for about well, closed his eyes, laid down for about 30 seconds, popped back up and was just fine. Huh. But he glitches a lot. It's like the program isn't quite right. And it's noticeable. I've brought it up to other people and they're like, oh my God, he does. That's so weird. That's so like his, others yeah. have even noticed it. But they say that the, the, the Pentagon papers that came out not long ago, they admitted that they have these things, that they've been around, and that a lot of them came in as animals. They thought at first they started as birds. But what's the easiest way for an entity to watch you without you knowing it? Well, bring it in as an animal. People are animal lovers. We let them in our homes. We don't even question it. Yeah. So they can study us easily without ever being seen, known, or, or anything. They see our behaviors. They watch our families. They know what we do. They know everything about it. So if you watch your dogs, and it's not, I don't believe it to be all dogs, but I do believe it to be a large number of them because if not, our spayed and neuter programs would be working, and they're not. <laughs> um, we still have an overabundance of animals, and in the last two years, it has gotten worse. Instead of getting better, it's getting worse. We have more in our shelters. We have more in our rescues. Um, and more people are, you know, people are adopting, but we still have an overabundance of these animals coming in. And it's just something to, you know, as being in this field that I've been in for so long and the behaviors of the animals in the last 15 to 17 years, the, the behavior of animals has changed drastically. As a dog trainer, 
it has changed drastically. It's just something for people to keep an eye on. Uh, be nice to them. You never know. <laughs> you yeah. just don't know. Yeah. Oh, Anyways, yeah. I just thought it was. All right. Well, thank you again for calling in with another great one. I mean, if you have any more experiences with them and maybe you get something on video or something like that, we'd like, love to see that. So. Well, I've been working on it. I'm trying to get, I would love to, to get Aria too to do a couple of her things on video. I haven't really worked with it in the last couple of weeks after I did. I, I, to be very honest, it freaked me out. Um, right. And I kind of just shut up about it for a little bit. This first time I've talked to <laughs> Public about it because it's huh. blatantly obvious. Yeah, I can see how it can be freaky. But... All right, well, we'll be here uh, doing this once a week, so you're always welcome to come back on and share another great story with us. Hey, I live in New Orleans. We have a few, but thanks for letting me on again. <laughs> All right, thanks again. You have a good night now. Bye. Bye -bye. Oh, I'm still here. I'm just going to jump out and listen now. All right. Yeah. Bye. Hang out. Please. Thank you. Yep. Bye bye. The story that I am going to tell you guys is like, I often forget about it because it was such a normal part of my life growing up. Um, but when I was, I think, like, from the time, from, from 11 years old to I think 17 or 18, my mom worked at a family shelter um, in Boston, Massachusetts. And this shelter was actually half of a, uh, half of a Catholic, it's like, a, it was a Catholic church at one time that they converted to living quarters for the priests. And across the courtyard was living, like the nuns had their own building. They had two separate buildings. In the priest's building, they converted half of the building into um, a home for homeless families. And it was a three-story building the building was very old. It dated back to the 1800s. Um, but I didn't know this as a kid. You know, as I got older, I started researching. But a lot of paranormal things um, happened in that place. And as I was growing up, um, my mom had five kids. So she, when she went to work, she would take us to work and we would hang out with the fam the kids of the families that lived in the shelter and like there was a huge courtyard this beautiful round courtyard that was like um you couldn't even see it from the street it was kind of insular and we would play games in that courtyard kickball um baseball it was just like perfect for those games and <clears throat> uh most of the courtyard was covered in grass and on the grassy areas where we would play. And the reason it was perfect for those games is because there was a very big, like, it was a piece of stone that was set into the ground. It was flat marble, right? And on either side, like, in not on either side, in every corner of this piece of, like, flat marble that was set into the dirt, um were these kind of like prongs, these thick metal prongs sticking out. They'd been worn down over the years, but that's what we would always use for home base. And like we just had so much of my childhood was spent like playing in that area. And um, I remember my older brother, he's like four or five years older than me. He had said it one time and I had asked him what he meant and he didn't elaborate he kind of just completely ignored the fact that he said this but I was like I one day we were out there playing and just out of nowhere I was like I wonder what this used to be and he gives me this look and he's like it, he's like I think it used to be a headstone and I was like what 
And he was like, what? Literally, just like that. That is how the conversation went. And I was like, you just said this used to be a headstone. And he's like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, all right, whatever. You know, you're being an ass. <laughs> so um, uh, my mom, as I got older, my mom uh, switched to the night shift. She was only there at night. And she would sometimes take one of us with her, like one of the kids with her. Um, it was usually myself or my very much younger sister was almost a baby. She was like a toddler at the time. And um, <clears throat> I remember one night, her office was on the second floor and the third floor, no, let me explain. The first floor was the kitchen area. It was a huge kitchen. Every family had their own table, their own refrigerator. The second floor was a set of offices. And I'm remember, yep, second floor was a set of offices. Third floor was a set of offices that my mom worked in. And I'm sorry, not three stories, it was four stories. The fourth floor was where the family stayed. They had enough room for seven families and a huge playroom on that floor. Now, when my mom worked, I would, she would sometimes have to run down or run up to one of these floors and I would be alone in the office. But that place was like a second home to me. So I was never really afraid, afraid um, to be alone in that office. And I remember this is the only paranormal thing that happened to me on the um, grounds. But I heard her call to me from downstairs. And I was like, well, that's impossible because I saw her go upstairs. She ran upstairs to deal with something that had happened with a family up there in the middle of the night. And I'm like, so I didn't leave the office. I just called out the door, mom. And she was like, yeah. And I heard her start to come up the stairs. And I'm like, and you can definitely hear someone on the third floor. If you're on the third floor, you can definitely hear somebody start to come upstairs from the first because it's just a very creaky kind of like build. You could just hear it. So I'm like, oh, and I could even hear her like stop and like rest a little on the first floor. Like she usually um, on the second floor, like she usually does. And then take, take the rest of the flights. And just as she should have been like coming up onto the landing where I could see her at the door to the office. Like, she didn't come. She wasn't there. So I was like, that's weird. I was like, so I was like, oh, she's probably like, you know, as a kid, you're like, oh, my mom fell down the stairs or something. I don't know. Maybe maybe she's just like, she had a heart attack coming up the stairs. So I come rushing out the door like, mom, are you okay? And again, I literally hear her say, yeah. Like, kind of annoyed. And when I got out on the landing, there was nobody there. She wasn't there. Like, at all. And I'm like, what the? So I ran. I ran back into the office, shut the door and locked it. And, you know, eventually she actually does come to the door and she's knocking on the door and she's like, what are you doing? You know, you can't lock doors in here. That's a fire hazard. Like, don't ever do that again. And like, I'm crying. And she's like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I told her what happened. And she she was like, calm down. She's, she, it's, it's not that big a deal. It's an old place. Nothing bad happened. Calm down. So like, I remember sleeping there that night and like the next day telling my brothers and sisters what had happened. And it started something like, it's weird. My brothers and sisters and I were very, very close as kids and we told each other everything. So I was completely like shocked when all of a sudden all these stories start pouring out of my older sister and my older brother. And they start telling me everything that has ever happened to them since my mom started working there and we started hanging out there. And they're like, that place is corroded with ghosts. Like just, oh, it's it's rife with ghosts. And I'm like, What? And my older sister is talking about seeing nuns, like, in full habit, walking around in broad daylight. By the time my mom had started working there, there were no nuns working there anymore. The only person um, 
from the archdiocese that worked there was the priest who ran the whole shebang. We'd see him all the time. But they're like, no, we would see them walking around, like outside, nuns in full habit. And I'm like, what the hell? And like, we told mom, but mom would just tell us to ignore it. And I was just like, this isn't like, you know, so it became like creepy pasta in our family to tell these stories. Like I would retell the stories that my brothers and sisters had told me about what they experienced there. Right. And I'd say, I think I was about 21, 22 when they finally closed the entire, um, that entire swath of buildings, they closed them. And about five years after that, no, even longer, I'm sorry. It might have been 10 years. Yep. 10 years after they closed um, the shelter and people had moved on from the property and the property was closed down. Um, the the city, no, no, the archdiocese tried to, they sold the land to the city so that the city could build, um, what do they call those schools? Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blinking. They wanted to build a school. They called the school City on a Hill. And it was an alternative school for children in high school. It was an alternative high school. That's right. So there were in total three buildings um, on the land. And when, so they started digging to build this school. Um, sorry, hold on. They built half the school and the kids were attending that part of the school. When they went to tear down the building that my mom used to work in and the smaller building beside it that um, had been condemned a long time before my mom ever worked there, they found bodies in oh. that courtyard that we used to play on when we were kids. Oh. Hundreds and hundreds of unmarked graves stacked people stacked on top of each other it looked like they had been doing it for like a century or more burying people there um and when the city requisitioned the records from the archdiocese the archdiocese said we have no records of those bodies being there oh wow which was pure bull like pure bs they absolutely always knew that those bodies had been there. The official record that they could find um, and that the city also had information on was that um, <clears throat> at one time, it was a residential school for not just a residential school, also residential housing for Irish immigrants who were coming to this country to work. Right at the turn of the century, maybe just around uh, eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, at some point during the Industrial Revolution, and that's about it. That's all the information that they had. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. And that there had been a graveyard there, um, and that when it was converted to housing for the clergy. They had moved those bodies to a cemetery down the, um, like in the neighborhood. And I know of that cemetery, um, but they didn't move the bodies. They moved, they only moved the headstones. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that makes sense because when you remove bodies, the base of the headstones get displaced. And we were using the base of a headstone for our home base all the time. So they oh. obviously couldn't have moved the bodies. Right? <laughs> and so all those people who had been buried there, they have no names. Um, they're just unknown dead people. And they'd been that way for over a century. And um, when that came out, I was... I was already 
my brothers and sisters and I, we were all grown up and moved to different parts of the city. Um, well, this, different parts of the state. And I was like, you know what? I want to know if they saw anything. So <laughs> I was like one at a time, like, you know, bringing it up with each one. And I'm like, yeah, did you see anything? I have an older sister who is, she doesn't like talking about this stuff at all. She's like, holy roller, saved, gave herself to God. Like, you know, she doesn't like any swearing and cussing and anything. And I was at her house one day and I was just like, oh, I was actually interviewing her for um, this project I had at college, you know, interview a Christian, basically. I needed to interview a Christian. And while I was interviewing her, I thought, I was like, you know, this is a good time to ask her. She's all opened up and everything. And maybe I, can, I was like, by the way, <laughs> and I'm telling her about what happened with the school. And she's like, yeah, I know all about that. She's like, um, that's just, that's a terrible shame. All those dead people there forgotten for all this time. Like I cry for them sometimes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and she's like, no, she's like, sometimes I cry for them. And I'm like, so I reminded her of some of the things that she had told me that she had seen when we were kids there. And she was like, listen, she's like, the devil is real, okay? We live in two worlds. There is the world of, of the spirit and there's, you know, the world of the worldly. And thank God that we live in, and I'm like, okay, okay. But can you get to the juicy parts? And she told me that, she always knew that there were dead people somewhere on that property. She was like, because she mentioned one of the young kids that used to um, live there. I remember this kid. He was like a very, very sweet person. Like when you meet people like this, you never forget them. They're just really sweet and good, like through and through. She was kind of like that when we were kids and they used to hang out together all the time. They were like peas in a pod. And she said they used to stand, um, sit in one of the kitchen windows and watch the dead people walk across the field. And I'm like, excuse me? And she was like, you could see them in broad daylight. They would just be slowly walking up from one end of the field to the other like they were lost and I was like well how do you know that they were dead because this was like during like the crack epidemic <laughs> you know what I mean and like there were a lot of people walking around looking like that and mm -hmm. she was like no she was like first of all they were white and we lived in a predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhood and she was like second of all they were dressed in rags like raggedy clothing and she's like no we knew we were looking at dead people but we were scared to even mention it we would just get together in the middle of the day and watch them walk and i'm like why would you never tell somebody that she's like well that's why i gave my life to god because you know i've always been able to see things like that and I'm like, gee, you know what I'm like, gee, the things you find out when you like sit people down and actually talk to them. But it was like pulling teeth, getting it out of her. And um, she was like, I also used to, she was like, there's a lot that goes with that property. She was like, um, one of the main reasons I got saved was <clears throat> I looked up the history of that um that place where we spent most of our time and there's a history of very bad history with that particular order um, of in the archdiocese. I guess it's the order of St. Joseph. She was like, apparently the order of St. Joseph was at one time, like um, ran out of the Catholic faith because they had a lot of, like apostate type beliefs and were known to abuse the people in their care. And she's like, there's, she's like, if you look it up, there's like a long history of it. And at some point the French people and the Catholic church were like, enough is enough. We're going to burn some of these, um, these 
priests and nuns that belong to the order at the stake. And then we're going to close the order forever. She was like, during the time that the Irish began to move into the United States, um, like they were immigrating in mass, the order par- popped up again here in the United States. And where we, where our mother worked was one of the big, important muckety mucks of the St. Joseph order. And I was like, what? And she's like, yes. And she was like, um, I believe that a lot of the people who died there did not die like from natural causes or if it was, it was because they were starved. She was like, something awful happened to those people. She's like, because ever since our mother used to bring us there to like hang out all the time, she would have these dreams about a furnace a very big furnace. Um, and I know what she, I know exactly what she's talking about actually, because the furnace does exist. We, so as kids, we used to break, not break in, but we used to go to the abandoned parts of the property, the parts that were boarded up and had um, signs on them that said, don't go in here. You know, it's dangerous. Don't go in. We would go in. Like, I would sometimes get my cousins and be like, hey, let's go. And we'd go into the old buildings. And one of those old buildings did. It had a huge furnace in it for some reason. Like, it wasn't attached to anything, this furnace. It didn't have, like, piping or anything. It was just, like, this standalone giant oven. And she's, according to her, she's never been in this building. And I'm like, okay. She's like, I used to have these dreams that people were being fed into that thing. She's like, either after they were dead or they had done something that the nuns and the priests didn't like and they would throw them in there. And I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) She's like, so I don't know if any of it's true because there is almost no history on what that structure that place that we used to play around in okay so boston is famous be- joining in we got a, another one from miss yuri is gonna end us off the night with another story here we are <laughs> hi <laughs> i'm back <laughs> She's back. I have a short one. It's a good one. All right. Okay. Um, so this one, uh, I was yet a little girl. I was like seven years old. Uh, me and my brother, we ended up traveling back to my mother's country, which is Panama, Central America. Uh, and we traveled back with my mom. So when we got into the country, um, my grandmother and two of my aunts came to pick us up from the airport and they took us back to my grandmother's house. And, you know, it was a new country, new place. So it looked very interesting and different than America for me and my brother. But we were really, really excited about the whole experience because it was our first time uh, meeting like my aunts and uncles from Panama and my cousins from Panama. So really exciting time, whatever, whatever. So I remember uh, my grandmother, she had like a schedule of when we went to sleep and everything. We weren't used to that at the time. So um, she said we had to be in bed by 7 o'clock p.m. So we ate dinner like around six o'clock. And I remember at the time me and my, me and my brother asked my mom, like, why did we have to go to sleep so early? And, you know, we were kind of like whining and stuff, wanting to play and watch TV. And my grandmother came in the room and she was like, she sat down and she was like telling us in Spanish because we speak, you know, Spanish and English. But my grandmother only spoke Spanish. So she told us in Spanish that we couldn't we couldn't uh, go to sleep so late because 
if we did, the witches would crawl, you know, over the roof, you know, on top of the roof or whatever. So me and my brother looked at my grandma. Then we looked at my mom. It was like, mommy, why is grandma lying to us? (laughs) (laughs) Right? (laughs) So, (laughs) so, um, so anyway, so my mom was like, no, it's true. So me, I'm a skeptic at heart when it comes to certain things. And I looked at my mom and I look out the window because in the room that they put us in, it was my mom's old room. But her window, her room had this big window, but it had like those old time rails on it. You know, those uh, metal black rails or whatever. Yeah. So you couldn't like look out too far. Only right there. Anyways, we ended up uh, not being able to go to sleep. So me and my brother, we were playing, you know, while my mom was asleep. So it's like maybe I'm assuming like 8.30, 9 o'clock p.m. And the next thing you know, we hear footsteps on the roof. And it's raining too, right? But then the rain stops. You don't hear rain anymore. But you hear all these footsteps, like, running back and forth on the roof. And I'm like, I wake my mom up. I'm like, mommy, 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 what is that? She said, your grandmother told you to go to sleep. The witches are on the roof. I'm like, what? You know, as a kid, you're, like, freaked out, right? Yeah. So, anyways, um, me and my brother got really scared, so we ended up falling asleep. In the morning... My grandma wakes us up like at 6.30 in the morning. That was scheduled to give us some tea and uh, cheese toast. And we get up in the morning and we're shook. So I look at my grandma and I ask her in Spanish. I'm like, um, I, well, I didn't really ask her, but I told her in Spanish. I said, la bruja <laughs> was here, you know, and my grandma started cracking up. She starts cracking up. And she said, I told y'all to go to sleep early. Y'all didn't go to sleep. I heard y'all laughing all night. So I was like, so is that real? The witches? You know, la brujas? Because that's what they call them in, uh, in Spanish. And my grandma was like, yeah, they're real. But here, they fly. She said, I don't know what they do in America, but here, they fly on the roof and they try to eat little children and I was like what so I'm freaked out and then the next thing you know um she you know like during the daytime we're able to go play but she lets us play only you know only within the the confines of the gates like we couldn't go outside the gate in her country to play because she said that witches snatch children you know uh, there in the daytime too so I'm creeped out as a kid but anyways and she told me to stay away she said if a if a, a lady who's short and have a real real big stomach come out to the front of the gate don't go down there because she's a witch she's a bruja and I'm like what's her name <laughs> and she's like her name is I, I, I really don't want to say her name because it creeps me out but anyways, um, she told me her name or whatever. And I'm like, hmm? So anyways, uh, me and my brother, we're playing. And I seen this lady go, you know, by the gate. And she's waving at me to come here. And when I looked at her, you know, I seen her big stomach. But, you know, I'm, I'm a curious kid. So I walked down to the gate. And... She looked at me and she said, she said in Spanish, you know, she said, you're a very special child. She said, most children stay away from me. She said, but you're not scared. And I looked at her and I'm like, no, I'm not scared. I was like, you don't look bad. (laughs) You know, like to me, she wasn't a bad person. She didn't have a bad spirit. And then I asked her, I was like, are you a bruja? And she said, yes, I am a bruja. I said, so you're going to eat me? And she said, no, 
She said, I only eat bad kids. And I looked at her, my eyes <laughs> got big, and she started cracking up. And I'm like, the fuck? You know, it was a kid. So my grandma comes outside, and she sees me talking to the lady. And she's like, Yuriko, Yuriko, then I got. She's yelling at me. I'm scared as hell. I run up the hill back to my grandma. She whoops my ass. And she said, I told you not to talk to the bruja. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, when we go inside the house, she's hitting my mom because my mom wasn't watching us. <laughs> but she's whooping my mom's ass. <laughs> so, so uh, I remember my mom was asking me, why would you go talking to the witch if your grandma said not to talk to the witch? I said, well, she's not a bad witch. She's a good witch. And I was like, and I'm not scared of her because she's not, she's not bad. She had a good spirit. I said, if she said she only eat bad kids. So um, my mom was like, oh my God. And I'll never forget after that incident, every time I came out to play, she now her house was interesting you couldn't like she lived across the street from my grandmother's house but you could not see her house her house was like in the woods like i can't explain it like to get to her house you would have to cross like a little bridge but the bridge was made out of wood like out of trees and huh. then it went into the woods and then you could see her house she had like a little hut yeah, and the only reason why I know that is because I was a mischievous little girl, <laughs> and I was very curious, and my grandma left her gate open one day while me and my brother was playing, and she called me across the street to talk to her, and I went to her house, and I sat with her, and yeah, we talked, and then she knew she knew when my grandma was coming, so she would send me back across the street to her house before she actually came and yeah and that's that's my my story um <laughs> my short story <laughs> it's, it's longer i have like i said i'll share more stories later but yeah, yeah. that's my story with la bruja la bruja <laughs> la bruja I'm not gonna say her name because I know she passed on, and and I know that she, I just know that she could come back around, and I don't really want her in my space like that. <laughs> right, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I hope y'all have a good night, though. Yeah, thanks again for coming on, and we'll see you on the next show with another story. I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.